of, but also as I'll point out on a number of occasions and then actually uh, in, a, in a particular same sense, just not talking about, uh, talking about the topological states of matter, um, which uh, actually do have kind of non imping band structures associated with them, but not band structures for electrons, but for Majorana fermions. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about uh, 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 search for quantum spin liquids and in particular uh, looking at cobalt based compounds as a avenue for finding systems with very strong bond dependent exchange interactions that frequently now we refer to as, as Kitai of interactions. These materials have been looked at quite a bit in the context of iridate materials and ruthenate materials, particularly the celebrated alpha ruthenium chloride. In this talk, I'm, I'm gonna argue that although there's been fascinating and wonderful work done, those materials have certain non-idealities and that it may be as originally pointed out uh, theoretically that cobalt based D7 materials are uh, a good platform and in many ways maybe a better platform. So before I do that, let me um, thank the people who made this possible just very quickly in the interest of time. Uh, the work I'll talk about on a 1D chain compound, which is kind of a, a, a starting point for us in our understanding here was done by my former postdoc, Chris Morris. The work on the hexagon cobalt compound is done by my uh, former student who's now at UCLA as a postdoc, Shinshu Zhang. Uh, of course, uh, all kinds of wonderful collaborations with my close colleagues at Johns Hopkins, Tyrell McQueen, Sayed Kupia, Oleg Chernyshev, Colin Broholm, uh, various students, uh, Natalia Drichko, various students at uh, Johns Hopkins, Yuan Yuan Zhu. And uh, we've had uh, Tom Holleran, uh, a wonderful collaboration with Rebu Call at the University of Kentucky, the last place I went until this fall to give a, to give a colloquium was at the University of Kentucky at the end of the talk, got to talking about some details of this 1D chain compound that we didn't understand. And uh, a very nice paper that was in Nature Physics uh, came out of that work. Uh, so go, nice to go and visit people and give colloquia. Uh, interesting work comes out. Uh, we have uh, his student Nishita, and then also uh, work with Thomas Rune's group in Estonia. We, we had a collaboration. I'll show you some data from that. Uh, I won't have time to talk about some related theoretical matters that were done with uh, with uh, such stuff. So uh, I'll give you my my. Um, conclusions in the beginning. For, so when I invariably run out of time, you've already seen them. Uh, I will tell you about uh, cobalt-based magnets and in particular corn, uh, edge sharing cobalt magnets, which uh, have been proposed to have strong bond dependent interactions, we refer to as the Kitayev interaction. Um, I'm gonna tell you first about this material here, cobalt niobate, cobalt niobium 206, which we worked on for a few years. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about some older data, which is, uh, uh, what happens with these kinds of nine so-called meson bound states at low temperature. Some of you may have seen this data previously, uh, but then I'll talk about our, our new understanding of that. In particular, what happens when you take the system, you put it in a transverse magnetic field. Um, we believed originally this system was the best material realization one had of a de easing chain that, that you could tune through a quantum critical point in transverse field, kind of a paradigmatic model for quantum phase transitions. But now we believe uh, it is that, but it's more that it's actually also the best realization, best kind of example we have of strong dependent interactions, which I think give basically incontrovertible proof for a Kitayev-like interaction. So I'll, I'll get to there as well. And then some other things as well that I can't help telling you about, which I think is the first kind of experimental, direct experimental evidence for kramers vanier duality in such systems. And then I'll kind of flash, I think I won't have enough time to talk about it too, too much, but uh, I'll talk about this in a system that we want to propose as a more ideal Kitayev spin liquid system, this barium cobalt arsenic compound. Okay. All right, so uh, first Kitayev interactions. So um, uh, in um, uh, this, the search for a quantum spin liquid is, uh, is of course a long story and I'm sure familiar to, to most people in the room. In 2006, Kitayev pointed out that this funny Hamiltonian here where has strong bond dependent interactions where on a hexagonal lattice where it's, if you will, the X component interacts along the green bond, the Y components of spin interact along the blue bond and the Z component interact along the red bond with changing variables to a Majorana representation could allow, admit an exact solution of this system, which is that uh, at the lowest temperatures, the system would be a quantum spin liquid. So exact solution, all kinds of things can be, uh, can be calculated. Uh, exact solutions and exact models are frequently useful in physics, even if they're perhaps not particularly um, 
one doesn't have a clear route of how one realized them because they at least they show you, for instance, in this case, how a particular that that a particular state of matter could at least potentially be realized. Let's say there's no other uh, law of nature that prevents such a thing from happening. I think in the early days, though, it wasn't perhaps appreciated that in fact that this perhaps seemingly rather artificial interaction with different spin directions interacting in different directions could in fact be realized in various systems, transition metal oxides with edge sharing octahedra with strong spin orbit coupling. And this was pointed out by Jekeli and Kululin in 2009, demonstrated the possibility for bond dependent interactions in sharing octahedra with strong spin orbit coupling. And so you can imagine some system here where we might build a hexagonal lattice from these core sharing, uh, sorry, edge sharing octahedra. And what Jekeli and Kululin showed is that there are multiple exchange paths. And as a result of multiple exchange paths, there are various cancellations which happen in the exchange actions. And the exchange interaction that they emphasized showed that the exchange was perpendicular to this, say, plaquette here that bridges the two octahedra could be strongest uh, with particular symmetry considerations. And then coming back to this picture here, you see that uh, with, again, edge sharing octahedra, this would promote a SZSZ -SZ interaction, an SYSY -SY interaction, an SX SX interaction in exactly the same fashion. So as I mentioned, uh, in various uh, iridate and iridate compounds and ruthenate compounds, this physics has been that quite a bit. Uh, but it's also been proposed for cobalt plus two systems. That's the point of my talk today. The work that's been done, there's been a lot of really quite interesting work done in iridates and ruthenates. Um, in the, the full, this is the, the, I'm sorry, it's blocked right here, but you can see the Kitai of interaction. Um, the, um, the full symmetry allowed Hamiltonian doesn't just have the Kitai of term. It also has a Heisenberg term which in an ideal case is a, is a small perturbation on the larger Kitayev term, but doesn't necessarily have to be. And then symmetry allowed is also the so-called off diagonal gamma term here as well. Okay? So those terms you always have in any particular Hamiltonian, the six diagonal less. It's very frequently the place you also, also frequently the case that you have this gamma prime term, which is also allowed. If you take this lattice, if you will, and you squash it a little bit, the so-called trigonal distortion, this is also symmetry allowed. The, and then we can, of course, have other terms as well. There can be J3 term, which is a next nearest neighbor, next next nearest neighbor interaction. And we might like to put a magnetic field on the system as well. So that would be the full Hamiltonian. So the real materials, when you take them and you, for instance, cool them down, may realize perhaps a phase diagram that looks something like this. And although somewhere in parameter space, a uh, nice Kitayev spin liquid may exist, it's clear that all real materials we have as you cool, down, cool them down, they come into a long range ordered, a long range magnetic ordered state. What is believed in some of these compounds, when you apply a magnetic field to it, this Kitai of spin liquid may exist in a finite region of parameter space at finite magnetic field. And if you will say, imagine a material which exists as exchange parameters that puts it here, let's say along this plane with applied magnetic field, you can come out of the magnetically ordered phase and then into this particular region here where you kind of cut through a little bit Kitai of spin liquid. Depending upon the field direction, the details here can, can differ, and there can be different, different non equivalent spin liquids uh, that, that exist in the region here. And I don't want to get into those particular details. What's clear, though, in all of the existing materials of the iridates and the ruthenates is that these other terms here, the J, gamma, the gamma prime, and even the J3 can be large, considerable. Not only do they impede a kind of a more immediate theoretical understanding, they also mean that very frequently, to be able to induce a quantum spin liquid state, you have to apply very, very large magnetic fields. And so the in-plane magnetic field to suppress magnetic order for alpha ruthenium chloride is something of order about eight Tesla, but nobody has ever been able to induce the more preferable direction would be to put a magnetic field along the Z direction. And the estimates there based on the, the size of the gamma, gamma prime terms in, in the J term is probably something about 50, 60, 70, 80 Tesla. So that would be for alpha ruthenium chloride. Therefore, it is uh, uh, beneficial and of interest to look for materials that would have smaller non Kitayev terms. And that's what this talk is about. So, um, and, and the, cobalt, uh, the cobalt compounds have been proposed, proposed to do that because it's a D7 material, which has, in addition to the T2G orbitals, also has EG orbitals filled, and the EG 
the exchange interactions between the EG electrons induces a, a ferromagnetic gamma term, which compensates the antiferromagnetic gamma term from the T2G electrons. I can talk more about that if you like. I want to go on to the data. So I am going to talk more about hexagonal magnets and in particular the realization of this quantum spin liquid, but I'm going to get there in kind of, if you will, a little bit of a roundabout fashion. Um, the experts in the audience may kind of realize where I'm going with this from the beginning. Um, but let me take a diversion first, and that's through a cobalt material, uh, cobalt niobate, some material that I've been interested in for a long time. It was for, pointed out by Radu Koldea in this work now over 10 years ago, that this material cobalt, niobate, the zigzag quasi 1D chain zigzag here. Cobalt is a material that has uh, strongly bond dependent, uh, I say strong easing interactions. And Koldea proposed this to be the best material realization of a 1D easing chain that you could tune through a quantum critical point with transverse magnetic field. He proposed that there was some interesting magnetic phase right at the quantum critical point. I'm not gonna keep that exhibited a higher E8 symmetry. I'm not gonna talk about these details at all. Um, I wanna talk more about the kind of more uh, underlying physics that is used to describe the underlying magnetic order and excitations of this chain. Before I do that, let me give a brief uh, interlude to the kinds of physics we expect in the 1D chain. So if I have a ferro chain that I imagine coming in with a, with a, um, with a photon or a neutron and flipping a spin, a one-dimensional ferromagnetic chain like this exhibits a phenomena of fractalization meaning that we don't believe that the elementary excitations of the system are spin flips, but they're more of these, say, domain walls, which are exhibited between regions of ferromagnetically aligned spins. This phenomena of spin fractalization found in 1D chains, but also found in higher dimensional spin liquids. This is a kind of an interesting and in general phenomena, but hard to quantify properly because in the spectroscopic response always gives you broad, even if you have very well-defined excitations, always gives you very, very broad, ill-defined spectroscopic features. You kind of come in with a photon or you come in with a neutron, you flip a spin, the energy and momentum goes off into two particles and those two particles carry off some amount of energy and some amount of momentum. And so even though you may have very well-defined elementary excitations, the, the say the, the two spin-on state or the two domain wall state gives you these broad features here. These are actual terahertz absorption spectra for cobalt niobate. Uh, these two peaks here represent the edges of the one kind of peaks in the one dimensional density of states. But even though the excitations we believe are, are, are quite long lived, uh, the spectra is, is very broad. So this kinds of broad continuum behavior are one of the signatures of fractionalization, which in higher dimensional systems are a property of, of quantum spin liquid states. Now, um, because the, these, these domain walls, if you will, can just kind of run off in different directions. Now, the real material has uh, cobalt niobate has these 1D chains, but at lowest temperature, it actually undergoes two different phase transitions here, eventually into a commensurate antiferromagnetic state. So you get these ferro chains, which are then T ferro correlated to their neighbors. And so again, if I would come, imagine coming in with a neutron or a photon and I flip spins, I can kind of get these domain walls, which would go off into space, but you can see that this kind of, if you will, separation of the domain walls makes these spins here unhappy and it leads to a confining interaction between the domain walls here represented as these blue dots. So um, you know, one of the things that you learn, of course, in, in particularly in spin systems is that frequently the, the naive variables that you're presented with here, for instance, spins are not the best variables to understand the system. Uh, we could have Marana fermions in a, um, in a Kitaev spin liquid system, or here, a different kind of Majorana fermion, which we can represent here by these domain walls, okay? So these domain walls, in the, in the language of spin flips, these, if I flip a spin, it's a spin flip, but in the language of the domain walls, it's a tunneling term. And I can take this, let's say, linearly confining interaction between the two domain walls and the kinetic energy term, and I can map it in the continuum limit to a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. If I had, if this term here, so kinetic energy, if this term here was x squared, this we solved in terms of Hermite polynomials, but it's not x squared, it's x. And so it's solved in terms of class of special functions called area functions. The energy eigenvalue structure has this particular form here where there are these z sub j's, which correspond to the negative roots of area functions. 
And this was all pointed out, this work in, uh, in, in easing models in this article, 1978 by McCoy and Wu in Physical Review D. Physical Review D is the particle physics journal. People were interested in these kinds of problems in the context of particle physics because this linearly confining interaction between the domain walls has an um, analogy to quark confinement in QCD, where, if you will, the, the domain walls are the quarks and their bound state is a meson. So kinds of experiments we're doing is, uh, is time domain terror spectroscopy. I don't want to talk about the details of this much, but let me just say that we use an ultra fast laser propagating around the table to create and detect a pulse of terahertz radiation. This pulse is about a picosecond long an inverse of a picosecond is a terahertz. And so in this pulse has all of this Fourier content that we're interested in. The terahertz part of the electromagnetic spectrum was traditionally hard to measure materials, but with techniques like this, now we can do it very well. If you have a material, most, most of the time when we try to measure uh, materials at low frequencies with light, we use the time very electric field to couple to the electric dipole excitations in the system. But if a material is, let's say, electrically uninteresting, it's an insulator and it has interesting magnetic degrees of freedom, the time varying magnetic field of the light can couple to those, let's say, magnetic dipoles. And we can do very, very sensitive, high precision and high resolution measurements of the frequency dependent susceptibility of the system. So there's spectra. This is a plot of the absorption spectra as a function of frequency. You can see in the terahertz range, which corresponds to a few milli eV. We take the system and we cool it down. And around 20 Kelvin, we start to get long correlation length of these ferromagnetic domains forming along the chains. And earlier neutron scattering experiments showed that about three degrees Kelvin, the correlation length along the chain is something like 100 lattice constants. So it's almost ordered, but not completely. And then it goes through these two low temperature transitions into this, eventually to the state, which is an anti-ferromagnet, it's ferromagnetic chains, which are anti-ferromagnetically coupled to their neighbors and just boom, all of this sharp spectra just comes out. So if you're like me, who've spent your career doing uh, spectroscopy on solid state physics, you can marvel at a spectra like this because usually we don't have so many sharp peaks to look at. Our spectra are usually big and broad and not uh, sharp and beautiful like this. So let's look at just the lowest peaks. So there are the lowest temperature data. This is, uh, we're gonna label them M1, M2, M3, M4, da, 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 all the way up through M9. Then there's some other peaks, which I'm not gonna talk about so much. I can, if, you, if you're interested. Um, M but uh, there's this kind of sequence of lowest of nine peaks here. And we can take those, we can plot them, their energy versus some kind of index. That's M1, M2, M3, M4, all the way up to M9. And there is the model of McCoy and Wu that they wrote down in 1978 in Physical Review D based on these area function solutions where we can fit the whole discrete spectrum just with two three parameters in this measure. Um, so I think, you know, it's quite remarkable uh, uh, convergence of, of, let's say, theory and experiment many years later. Now, um, one of the things that we're interested in this system is, so that's all what happens with the system at zero magnetic field. But one of the things that we're interested in with the system is not the zero magnetic field spectrum, but using the system as a model for a quantum phase transition. And so in general, quantum phase transitions are characterized by a collapse of energy scales. So we can take a, a quantum phase transition, of course, we are gonna tune some non-thermal parameter. Uh, the 1D easing chain is in its ground state as a ferromagnet. All the spins are up or all the spins are down. If we put a very large transverse field on it, we spin polarize it, uh, we'll point all of the spins in the direction of the magnetic field. In zero magnetic field, the system has a two-fold degenerate ground state, but in very large transverse field, it's a singly degenerate ground state. And so you can't go from two to one smoothly. There has to be a quantum phase transition. Um, and it's a particularly interesting quantum phase transition because it's a very simple quantum phase transition. Um, one of the other things that this system is characterized by, this phase transition is characterized by, is a duality between the excitations of the system on one side of the transition to the excitations of the system on the other side of the transition. The excitations, as I mentioned, on this side of the transition, on the ferromagnetic side of the transition, are these domain walls, but on the paramagnetic side of the transition are spins. And so one of the things we're gonna be after is looking at the correspondence between the energy of the excitations and the paramagnetic side. 
and the energy of excitations on the, um, uh, sorry, between the ferromagnetic side and between the paramagnetic side. All right, so there's my yeah. illustration there. One of domain walls here and um, one of the spin flips there. In the context of the easing model, uh, this duality between the two sides of the transition is called Kramers von duality, um, was first proposed by Kramers and Vanier in the early 1940s as a possible route for understanding things about the two dimensional easing model. And it applies here to the one dimensional quantum phase transition. Uh, duality relations in phase transitions, is, uh, this is a very common thing, but the Kramers Vanier duality is probably the, the most recognized version of this and, uh, and also one of the more early. Uh, examples of this kind of uh, relations where you can, if you understand something, let's say about one side of the transition, you can understand something about the other side of the transition, but just with an appropriate variable transformation. Um, let me skip that point there. Okay, so this is data. Uh, this is a plot of the absorption versus frequency for the, uh, as we apply transverse magnetic field on it. So this is the susceptibility here. How much time do I have? I'm, I'm out of time? Yeah, but I mean, it's a 10 minute question. Oh, there's a 10 minute question time. Okay, that it wasn't, okay. Yeah, all right, I'll take a few more minutes and then just get to the, get to the point. Um, okay, so uh, when we apply a transverse field to the system, we uh, can first, we can see a number of things happen. There's this kind of narrowing of the spectrum. First that happens is the data that I've already showed you. It comes in, kind of narrows, and there's this kind of funny, peak that goes up to high energies here. And then there's this peak that comes down and then comes back up. So usually when you were, have quantum phase transitions, well, the annals of condensed matter physics where people are trying to, let's say, infer something uh, about the collapse of energy scales near a phase transition through some kind of scaling relation. Here, we don't have to infer anything about the collapse of energy scales near the phase transition. We can just see it directly. This energy here kind of comes down to the transition and comes back up on the other side. Uh, this was the data that I was showing to Ribu uh, call back in February of 2020 and told him that I didn't understand a few things about this. And one of the things that I didn't understand was when we first put the transverse field on the system, why spectra narrowed in this way. So this is a plot of the same data here, but plotted, let's say, with this absorption coming out of the board as a function of transverse field. And the spectrum first narrow before then they broaden in this fashion. This is at low temperatures and high temperatures. And so after some discussion, uh, we realized with Ribu that the structure of this 1D chain was in fact quite related to the structure of these hexagonal magnets that people were interested in the Kitai of interaction. So just to, let's say, get rid of that there, and then we can move this thing along as well there. And so this, for instance, the bond dependent interactions proposed for hexagonal lattice, if we imagine cutting a piece out of its fashion, very much resembles the zigzag lattice here with these edge sharing octahedra. So cutting to the, cutting to the end, um, the point is that uh, one can write down, which is essentially a Kitayev model, pure Kitayev model with uh, these bomb dependent exchanges, but where one realized that as you go down the crystal lattice here, the crystal symmetry allows the fact that the easing interaction, the easing interaction shall be changed, say back, back and forth as you go, let's say go down the chain in some fashion. Um, so you can take this simple model, imagine going to a limit, let's say imagine just to get some intuition where this twist, which we would call theta here is quite small. And one can write down and get intuition from this because what you see is, is that this has the consequence of if I apply HX as the externally applied transverse field, this twist from site to site, back and forth, plus or minus from site to site has a consequence of, of essentially a even odd internal transverse field in each of the bonds. So when I apply the external, so starting with the system with zero external magnetic field, the system has, if you will, an internal transverse field but one which switches site, site from bond to bond in the system. This is the source of the domain wall's kinetic energy, uh, even with zero external field, why they can even move at all when we don't apply any transverse field to begin with. You apply an external transverse field, and you can see what happens here is that some of the bonds will go up in magnitude and some of the bonds go down in magnitude. There would be some kind of extraordinary field, Bill, if this was the full model, where some of the bonds 
their exchange interactions just go to zero altogether and you can just get these isolated dimers. And that physics basically leads to the collapse of the bandwidth of the system before eventually the external field leads, we can imagine that these guys basically move through each other as you become close to the quantum phase transition, which would be over here. This would be this extraordinary field in this fashion. And um, it's one of these kinds of good ideas that leads to uh, immediately a bunch of other consequences, things that you didn't understand, that you didn't understand to begin with. Um, let me point out a relation to um, the talk of Fang Zhang was that uh, this model here is basically the, or the domain walls written in the language of the domain walls is essentially the um, Sushi for Heger model where we have on field dependent uh, interactions that could be tuned with the external transverse field. This is uh, uh, Nishita and Ribu's uh, DMRG calculations and you can see that they match the experiment with again, just very, very few free parameters. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip this uh, about the kramers vanya duality. And let me just say, that, um, I think that the data that I showed you there on the 1D chain really gives you very, very direct evidence. This shrinking of the bandwidth, this tuning of the bandwidth with applied magnetic field gives you very, very direct evidence for bomb dependent interactions that we can then see how they manifest themselves in higher dimensional systems. And since I'm out of time, I'll basically just say that we've been interested in this physics in the context of this barium cobalt arsenic system, which is cobalt ions that are arrayed in this particular fashion here. The work was first done in Bob Kava's group, but we've been interested in pursuing this system from uh, looking at this terahertz spectroscopy. And uh, I will just say that it does very, very similar things to alpha ruthenium chloride. Uh, except that we believe in accordance with the theory that these non kitaev interactions are much, much smaller. And so for instance, instead of eight Tesla magnetic field to get a transition to a putative spin liquid state for in-plane field, one sees this closer to about a half a Tesla. And for out of plane magnetic field, which has been proposed to be exhibited in alpha ruthenium chloride, something 50 or 60 Tesla, we can induce a broad continuum features, which we believe to be indicative of a, of a spin liquid state, something of order of about four Tesla in the system, so not 80 Tesla. And this is again, consistent with these very, very small gamma, gamma prime terms, which we believe is related to the um, uh, basically cobalt plus two 3D7, which is a, a um, we think is a very promising platform for the Kitai spin liquid physics. So that's all I'll say, but I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, um, so for the 2D material, uh, how, what fraction of the Kitai exchange or the estimated gamma? Uh, what what fraction is the estimated gammas? Yeah, yeah. So in this compound, it's um, we believe that numbers are. Did I actually put the number there? Let's see. Um, so the number itself, what we're sensitive to in this experiment is something like uh, the some sum weighted sum of what we call gamma, gamma prime, and so these numbers in this system are something like ten percent. We believe that these, let's say, the gamma terms are of order ten percent of the Kitayev exchange interaction. And so the number in uh, alpha ruthenium chloride is, is like about half. So it's both smaller in overall magnitude as well as smaller in percentage. Sorry? Yeah, well, it's, yeah. I mean, in any, in any case, it'll be something. And it looks like you probably will always have to, uh, you, we may always have to, supply some other uh, term like, or some other field scale like magnetic field, for instance, to suppress the spin liquid state. The point is from an experimental perspective, we can actually, you know, we can apply an out of plane field of a few Tesla and do it here where that's impossible in alpha ruthenium chloride. Yep, Peter, nice talk. So about this uh, transverse field icing chain compound, uh -huh. uh, I thought there was a sense of uh, inelastic neutron data. And I was wondering, the features that you see uh, in the terahertz spectroscopy, 
And would that be picked up by in last neutral? And uh, yeah, so the um, what we get um, the disadvantage of the experiments that we do is that we whatever we do is always at zero momentum. So in elastic neutron scattering, of course, is uh, you have uh, uh, access to the full uh, full momentum. Depends. You have the model, so what's that? You have the model, so like yeah. And so um, we haven't explored the signatures of this at finite momentum, but at the the we get this kind of exquisite picture of what happens at zero momentum, and so our model is kind of fully consistent. You know. Or is a, is a good description of the system for the data that we have. There may be additional features at finite momentum that show that, we, in fact, the, like the best description of this material is with some other terms that are like analogous to these gamma and gamma prime things. We don't need those to describe the terahertz data. So this is something we're working on now: is kind of trying to come up with a thank you. You know, uh, let's say starting with a complete um, uh, symmetry constrained exchange Hamiltonian. And then going from there with this kind of new understanding. So uh, this chain compound. Uh, so I missed this. Uh, Meson physics uh, Kizaev uh, thing comes in there, or it's a different story. It's kind of a different part. Different yeah. part of it. I mean, it, it, right? it is, and it's not. So the, the point is, is that uh, all the data that I showed you there, in this Meson regime, uh, was uh, we had the linearly confining interaction that comes in from the neighboring chains. But the domain walls also have to move. And how do they? So we, we have zero external field applied. So what provides the, the source of, say, the zero point motion or the kinetic energy for them at zero external field? We, we didn't know, and we just ignored that in our earlier work. We said, well, it comes from something. But now we know the source of it. And it comes basically from this Kitai of interaction or these bond dependent exchanges to things. So, so that means uh, uh, this measure thing, you're not going to see that in any other, say, icing 1D chain system, unless you have uh, some way you can have this motion. Yeah, so um, you need to have the motion. Right? And so the question is, how do you get it? So other systems which have been proposed to have this, are there other cobalt systems? But they're usually antiferromagnets with corner sharing octahedra. And so I don't know what provides the source of this kind of effective uh, 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 transverse field in those systems. There was some symmetry allowed term, and, and, I, and I don't know what it is. I haven't thought about those systems much. Thank you. Uh, so, why do you have nine uh, uh, modes? Mm. Meso mode. So why not ten or? Yeah. So uh, well. So this physics gets cut off at. Uh, let's see. Do I have the right slide here for this? So here, the the story, um, our understanding here has evolved. So um, originally, what we thought, why we didn't, is so. So this is the spectra. Uh, let's say at three Kelvin before the system orders, you have these long correlations say 100 lattice constants. So it's really, you can think of it as a 1D chain. And what we believed originally was that this region here that I've described in blue is kind of the regime of the two domain wall continua, but that there was a significant regime where there was a four domain wall continua. So you would go and you would eventually hit the edge of this two domain wall continua uh, and, uh, or rather you would go to high enough energies and it would basically get cut off by the four domain wall states. Um, now we believe actually that this is actually coming from um, uh, a, a different property of the system that, uh, let me open up here. Um, and uh, there's there. So when you make one of these domain wall pairs, you have a possibility of, uh, so you, we flip a spin, let's say, and that makes two domain walls. And uh, because of the zigzag chain, you have uh, essentially two bands of the domain walls. You have, say when you put a transverse field, you have a lower band and an upper band. And then you, when you excite the system and you make two domain walls, you essentially have uh, three choices. You could put both domain walls in the lower band, you could put one, both domain walls in the band, or you can put one in lower and upper, up, up, uh, one in the lower and one in the upper. And so, that physics comes in at some higher energy scale and basically cuts off that hierarchy of states that would kind of keep going up from there. So, uh, okay, we are a bit 
out of time, but if there are very short questions, then uh, we can can go. Sorry, I'm getting my work out of the day here. Yeah. <laughs> right, so in the um, picture with alternating magnetic fields along X, the alternating effect of magnetic fields, I believe you said that it realizes a Su Schieffer Heger model. Mm -hmm. Do you have a way to look at the edge modes of that system? Um, so, yeah, so let me go. So, um, so the edge modes would be, so that's an interesting idea. So you should have, um, yeah, uh, localized spin one half states at the end, at the ends of the system. Um, so in, um, you might be able to look at something in the context of, of looking at impurity substitution in the subsystems where you basically snip the, so the problem, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, when we look at a topological insulator, we have the surface states to look at. And those surface states, when we want to probe them, we couple to them with electric field, which is a pretty strong coupling. These are magnetic states. And so we couple to them with a magnetic field of light and that's very weak. So you'll never see surface magnetic states. There's just not enough stuff there to see it. So what has been done for um, Haldane systems is that they doped to basically snip the chains. And so they were looking to see the spin one half states at the ends of the spin one Haldane systems. And they doped them enough that they get a lots of kind of a, some multitude of impurity states that have some particular properties, which are the spin one half states of the Haldane chain. Um, presumably thing like that could be done here, but yeah, we, we haven't done that. Yeah. But th that would be an interesting thing to do. I have to think about uh, what specific signatures one might see. That, that could be interesting, yeah. Particularly because you could come through, uh, that might be actually quite interesting because unlike some of those Haldane chain systems, here you could tune it out of the topological phase. So you could be looking for these impurity states and you could tune it through the, topo through the topological, uh, through 1D phase transition, which is a transition from the Faro state, which is described by the Sushri figure perspective into the, um, into, into the paramagnetic regime where you shouldn't have that. So that's a, maybe a good idea. Yeah. You should have very different impurity response or uh, impurity effects in the two regimes. So that's a neat idea, yeah. Okay, let's call a halt there. Thank you again, Peter. And um, now we move on to the poster introduction talks. So I confess, I don't really know how this is gonna work. I guess whoever it is that's giving a poster today can come to the front and then you have a minute or perhaps a bit less to say something uh, to motivate us to come and uh, see what your work is. Uh -huh.